I say mm -hmm. I'm a work in progress. I have valleys and mountaintops like everybody else. I think all of us in the Christian life realize like we're never gonna be perfect in this world, not even close, but we're on this journey and hopefully growing and maturing and walking with Christ and trusting mm -hmm. him and knowing him. Uh, and in that finding the love of obedience to him and making wiser decisions, that's what I ask for wisdom and discernment and the willingness when I don't feel willing to do uh, the right thing and make the right choices, like make my heart willing. So it's a journey. Welcome, Shannon. What a joy to be talking to you today. I'm so excited about what we're going to talk about, which is look what I've done to your book. Well, we oh, can't, see. can't see it. You got the you old can't uh, see it. Yeah. It's got a marker. It's got a page marker. There's pen marks. <laughs> That's what I, I love to do to my um, books too. And I never want to give them up. I've got a few you can see, uh -uh. Right here. but I'm sort of like the person like bringing in the orphan books the orphan animals, you know, my husband's like, no mom, yeah. you have to give up one for every one that you bring in. But I'm like you, once you mark up a book and all your notes and study stuff is oh, in there, like, yeah. I don't want to give it up. Yeah, what are you gonna do with it? I yeah. mean, Plus, I don't want other people seeing yeah. all my stuff that I write in there. They're like, what are you now most struggling with in your life? <laughs> <laughs> what sin do you most struggle with? I don't want to write yeah. the notes. I'm like, well, I'm really having a hard time with X, Y, Z. And like, oh, here, would you like to read my book? I'm gonna pass it along to you. So Shannon, your book, The Women of the Bible Speak, which by the way, I'm glad that they are speaking, um, <laughs> was a New York They've Times bestseller. Yeah, they have been speaking. It's glad we're hearing from them. Um, so why the new one, Mothers and Daughters of the Bible Speak? Well, we look at some of the same women, but you meet a whole bunch of new women and we're looking at family relationships, which hello, that can be some of the most complicated stuff that goes on in our lives. And some of these relationships are really positive. You know, you see Jochebed and Miriam, this mother and daughter who work together to defy uh, their oppressors of the day and be very brave and courageous mm -hmm. and save and preserve the life of Moses, which of course was instrumental to everything that happened to the nation of Israel. But we also meet people who are a little flawed, which listen, I love that the Bible includes flawed. I'm flawed. I need forgiveness every day. And if God only used perfect people, there'd be nobody in the Bible. So um, we do look at the flawed relationships too. I mean, we look at Rebecca, who shows us some things you might not want to do as a mother with her two sons. So we look at pairs who also aren't related by blood, but maybe by marriage, Naomi and Ruth, and the mm -hmm. idea of spiritual mothers and daughters uh, with Elizabeth and Mary and others model relationships for us that we can find supportive and sort of a mentor mentee kind of thing. So I think family can come together in a lot of different ways. So we, we look at those relationships for the good and the bad in this book. Mm, that's great. Yeah. I noticed that you separated the book into mothers and daughters, mothers and sons and daughters and fathers. And mm -hmm. I thought, wow, you know, that is powerful. And zeroing in on daughters and fathers, because I had not really ever thought about that. And the one particular story that just really intrigued me. I hadn't realized that David's wife was Michael and mm -hmm. her father was Saul, who was yeah. trying to kill her husband, right. David. Wow. You yeah. just really opened my eyes up to that story. Tell me what you felt as you were really studying their relationship. Well the thing is, Michael, well, David is a very complicated figure, as you guys know. I mean, described as a man mm. after God's own heart, made some humongous, terrible mistakes, but God still used him. Again, very comforting to think about that. But Michael was his first wife, and she was very much in love with him. This is one of the only times we see in scripture mm. that a woman is expressing these deep emotions that she really loves this man and really wants to be with him. And she was Saul's daughter, one of his daughters. So <laughs> Saul had tried to marry off another one of his daughters to David, because I I think he he definitely saw him as a rival. The people were falling in love with David. He's having these enormous victories militarily and against people like Goliath. And, you know, he's got all this renown. And so um, David the demurs the first time with the first daughter that's offered saying, you know, I'm just a shepherd guy. I can't really marry into the family of a king. Well, Michael is got her heart set on David. And it looks like in the scriptures that Saul sort of sees this as if I can have him in my family and keep a closer eye on him, I can have somebody in Inside the household, oh, you know, it makes you okay. wonder whether he was using Michael because he kind of saw her as a bargaining chip. We see that over and over again. So mm. Saul models everything you don't want to do as a dad. He does give Michael to David as a wife, but it's so dastardly and twisted the way he controls this whole thing. And as you said, 
He tries to kill David multiple times. So if you think you have a bad mother-in-law or father-in-law, if they're not actively trying to murder you multiple times, you're still doing pretty good compared to the people in this book. <laughs> if they aren't sending armies out to find yeah. you in whatever it's, cave you're hiding spears in. At you. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a really good point. You know, and as you mm-hmm. studied that, Shannon, did, did you notice any dynamics as far as how we could better deal with our in-laws? Mm. Yeah, I mean, Asking obviously, for a if they're trying to kill you, they, you <laughs> might need to call the popo. I mean, I mean, I'll be like, it's there. Um, but really what it taught me more about was looking at this relationship of how we could be, you know, in better relationship to father and daughter, because Michael was sort of just viewed as this bargaining chip for Saul. Like he used mm. her in multiple ways to get mm. things done. He wanted to do to get to David. And you see later on in their story, how he just trades her off to another man who decides that should be her husband. And we never see any relationship between Michael and Saul where he is, I think as daughters, we want to think our dad is the one guy in the world who's going to protect mm. us and stand up for us. Yeah. And if someone wrongs us, he's going to be the first guy to show up. I mean, my dad, um, I was lucky enough to have two dads and that I had a wonderful stepfather too. And they both oh. always made me feel like I was val- valuable as a young woman. I mean, my stepdad, no lie, when people would come to pick me up for a date, which was a, a whole FBI vetting process to get to that, but he was always <laughs> cleaning his guns when they came, you know, like oh he was gosh. sending messages <laughs> like, my daughter is valuable and I love her and you better not harm a hair on her head. And the sad thing is Michael oh. never got that from Saul. And mm. uh, I think we can learn from the bad things and the bad relationships in the Bible, uh, as well as the good, or they wouldn't be in there. Good point. How did you first come to want to even tackle such a, a big subject as um, really examining the lives of especially the women in the Bible from your first book to this book now? Well, actually, Fox came to me with this idea. They said, we think we're going to huh? try out some books and we want to do something in the space with women. Um, we know your faith is you know, the most important thing to you in your life. Would you be interested in getting together on a book? And I always tell people normally... Hmm you know, with the schedules, we all keep throwing in something like that. I would say, well, let me pray about it and seek counsel. But I was like, yes, I'll do it. I was so excited by this prospect, not realizing kind of what I had bitten off, but you know, God is faithful and I give him all the glory and credit for getting these things done. He gave me what I needed to do it, but also (laughs) a team of people, um, you know, that I could reach out to theologians and people who've actually been to seminary that I could say, Mm I'm writing on the story. What am I missing? Or what does this mean in the original Greek or Hebrew? Um, So things that have been very helpful to me, it definitely took a group effort, but after doing it (laughs) once, I had a better idea of how to do it the second time around. And I love the process of learning about each of these women. They become so real to me in the process. And that's Mm -hmm. what I hope happens for uh, the readers of these books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you you talk about uh, Jochebed, you know, the story of a mother who took an enormous risk to save the life of her son, Moses, from Pharaoh. You you mentioned Mm -hmm. that, um, you know, in the relationship, you know, Jochebed's actions to preserve Moses. Again and again, we see God highlighting women and their roles in bringing his bigger plans out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think about her because, listen, we got to remind people she was a Hebrew slave. She was totally oppressed, had no freedom. And so she's in this situation where Pharaoh feels very threatened by the the Hebrew people who are multiplying and God is blessing them. And he says, all right, all of the the male babies are going to be killed. That's it. They all go throw throw them in the Nile when they're born. Mm -hmm. So Jochebed is very brave in that, you know, she's pregnant. I think about what is going through her mind. She is a pregnant slave, essentially, with no freedom, knowing, you know, in those days, you don't know if you're having a boy or a girl. But if I, if this boy, if this child comes out and it's a boy, I'm supposed to kill it. And she said, Mm. I'm not going to do it. I mean, the scripture tells us that she looked on Moses and saw something special in him, which Mm. every mom would feel for their baby. But she, Mm. it was something more, the language is that there's something more almost like a divine or spiritual blessing on him. And so she was very brave and she broke all the rules and like, nope, I'm keeping this baby. And I'm Mm. sure there were times he cried and she was thinking, Lord, please help me, you know, help our family to guard this baby. So he's got this older sister Miriam, who is part of the equation too, because, you Uh know, there comes a point where she has to let him go. um, And she launches him into this little baby ark that she's made out into the Nile. And Miriam is the one who goes along and does that. And how frightening to be this young girl hiding in sort of the bushes there, 
looking and watching and waiting to see what's going to happen to your little brother. And when Pharaoh's daughter happens upon him and is immediately has compassion and loves him, Miriam steps mm-hmm. up out of the weeds and says, Hey, if you need someone to nurse him, I, <laughs> I have someone. <laughs> so, I know. So person. They're all risking yeah. their lives the whole time here. To, to That's great. Wow. Just fascinating to see how that family dynamic worked together to preserve Moses. I mean, hello. It's just because uh, truly we say risking their lives. We say slaves. But so often all of that is kind of uh, softened to -hmm. not realize risking their lives. And, um, you know, it was just nothing for a slave to to be killed. So, wow, the women of the Bible have just made such a huge impact. I was really moved and kind of saw a modern day comparison, maybe, in the story of Rebecca. Once mm-hmm. you take Rebecca past her, her marriage and into the birth of her twins, wow, some whole new family mm-hmm. dynamics show mm-hmm. up that tell me if I'm wrong, but I kind of see a, a little um very popular story that was out recently about how <laughs> moms became involved in oh, helping getting their kids in their college children yes. It, yes yes tell me about discovering this about rebecca yeah so she starts off with such promise i mean she is the chosen wife huh? for isaac i mean so she's in this yeah. you know amazing lineage of abraham and isaac and all the promises about the nations to come and we see in the beginning when she is chosen for isaac to be his wife and they see each other there's this reaction that they must have really thought a lot of each other she essentially falls off her camel um we're told and i don't know if she tripped or what happened <laughs> But they seemed happy to see each other like this was a good match and that they loved each other. Mm -hmm. And it was years and years of infertility for them. But finally, she's Mm -hmm. pregnant with twins and it's not an easy pregnancy. And God tells her about what's going to happen with these um, two boys that are warring with each other, essentially. But what happens is when they're born, Isaac, the father, sort of has a favorite. She, Rebecca, the mother, sort of has a favorite. And these twin boys are at each other constantly. There is Mm -hmm. deception. They're like... It, listen, the Kardashians got nothing on this family because it's <laughs> crazy. I mean, it gets crazy. And um, yeah. it, it just, and she pours so much into her favored son. She helps him to deceive his brother, to deceive his father. I mean, it is so many twists and turns. And it, you're right. It reminded me of, of these mothers who in their mind, I'm sure think they're doing the best to make a great future for their kids. And I, so I include a little bit of that in the book, the coverage we had too, on those cases of the moms who got caught up in some dads, but it was a lot of moms caught up in the college admission scandal. Um, we covered a case too, about a mom and daughter down in Florida, my home state, who the mom is accused of breaking into the school system, the school district system, because she was an employee of the school district system and doctoring the votes so that her daughter would win homecoming <laughs> I mean, they both deny it, but like moms <laughs> making choices, allegedly in that case, um, you uh, know, moms making crazy choices is kind of a universal thing. If you think you know better and you want to do something that you think is going to give your kid a, a leg up, Rebecca didn't trust God. She did that for her son and it created a ton of pain. And you know what else I think too, think about the doubt that puts in, in the child that right. mom doesn't believe I can do it on my own. Oh, good point. And, you know, I think about what it must have been like for those twin boys and to see so many different layers, as you told the story, Shannon, of the, the husband and the wife, and then the two boys, and then mom thinks she's helping and um, instead of standing by and being that cheerleader for those guys, well, it occurs to me that I'm looking at you and I'm talking to a daughter. And I just would like to peel back the layers of Shannon Bream just a little bit, if you don't mind. I mean, as a believer, you have an enormous platform in, in TV. And I just, I, I'm just really appreciative of how you're using that platform. And I'd love to just hear a little bit about your own journey here. You alluded to your dad and your step dad and their importance in your life. 
Yeah. You know, I grew up in a home where my parents did divorce when I was young, but I was really blessed in that. Um, and, and my mom was a baby Christian at the time. They both grew immensely in their faith mm. and very amazing people. So I really always mm-hmm. say I had four great parents because um, my stepmother was wow. so kind. She had three boys and I think she was happy to have a girl. So we would do the girl stuff together. <laughs> and my stepdad Aww. was always there. I mean, I called him dad growing up and um, he is still around. He and my mom, I've mm. lost my dad and my stepmom. Um, but mm. I just was, you know, surrounded by people who wanted the best for me. And I took that for granted, I think, to some extent, because listen, we didn't have much materially. So I'll say things like, well, I didn't grow up with much. But when you think about it as an adult now, you think, well, no, I had parents who actually loved me, um, cared about what was mm-hmm. happening to me. We didn't have money, but that didn't matter. I mean, we were in church. We had a church community that was like family for us. And um, so I just really appreciate all those things. I mean, my mom is the person I admire most in the world. She has modeled Christ for me better than anybody. She's one of those ones that literally, if you see her and say, you know, tell her about what's going on. And she says, I'm going to pray for you. She'll probably do it right then. But she is down on her knees when the sun is coming up praying for you. If she Mm. told you she's going to, she has. And she is the hands and feet of Christ. She's the first one to show up with her homemade bread or a casserole or whatever you need. I know. I that <laughs> stuff gives a generation. I don't have the cooking gene. I think you know. <laughs> so I don't have that, but I do have the spiritual legacy from my mom. And hopefully, uh, I always say I want to be her when I grow up. So Shannon, where you uh, you grew up? It sounds like uh, you know in a Christian home. Have you always considered yourself a follower of Christ, or was there a pivotal moment where you said, "Yeah, I've made this decision." Yeah, I'm in. It was just such a comfortable thing to me to know the verses and be able to quote them. I, I grew up going to Christian school, K through 12, also where my mom was a teacher. So I was immersed in it all the time. But there was a point in seventh grade um, when I was at church camp, because y'all know a church camp. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. It occurred to me like, yes, I believe I believe all this stuff, but like I have to personally accept Christ and commit my life to him and say, mm-hmm. all right, this is yours. I believe you're my savior. You cover my sins. And if we're going to do this life journey together with me choosing you as my Lord and savior. So that made it, you know, the real personal commitment. I, I realized that, yes, I believe all this stuff and I love Sunday school and the Bible stories and all of that, but do I really accept it? for my life and um, Mm. accept and commit to Christ. And so that was the middle school uh, era. And, um, you know, that's such a tough time for kids anyway, but I say Mm -hmm. I'm a work in progress. I have valleys and mountaintops like everybody else. I think all of us in the Christian life realize like we're never going to be perfect in this world, not even close, but we're on this journey and hopefully growing and maturing and walking with Christ and trusting Mm -hmm. him and knowing him. Uh, And in that finding the love of obedience to him and making wiser decisions. That's what I ask for wisdom and discernment and the willingness when I don't feel willing to do uh, the right thing and make the right choices, like make my heart willing. So it's a journey. What is, Hmm. what is it like being a follower of Christ in such a huge media, well, media period, most of your life? find it incredibly comforting because I think with the things that we cover, sometimes it is so difficult Mm. not to be Mm. emotional about like what we're seeing in Ukraine. And I think it's okay, you know, to be emotional people. um, This is bad news and it's tough to see the images. We're in an era where because of social media, everybody can uh, immediately live you know, stream, whatever's right in front of them and happening, Mm. as long as um, those um, communications devices haven't been disabled, which is always something the enemy wants to do because they don't want you to see what's happening on the front lines. But this is different because we're seeing, um, you know, unfortunately, the bodies of dead children and pregnant Mm -hmm. women and Mm. horrible, horrible things. Um, So to me, I don't know how you do this job without some greater faith and something that this is not the end. This is not the final word. Um, God is very aware of our suffering. He is in the midst of it. There are believers all through Ukraine and Russia and all through that region who are praying for peace and who are praying for protection. And that's all I feel like I can offer them to. I mean, we can give to relief efforts and they're amazing um, faith-based and other groups that are there. Um, but I know that the most powerful thing I have to give is um, you know, the prayers that I pray And so um, I don't know if you cover all these things, you know, we lost two of our colleagues and um, one of our reporters, Benjamin, is still very, very uh, in a tough place um, physically. And I'm sure mentally because of what he went through in losing those two colleagues. Um, So, you know, short of having a faith outside of that, I don't know how you could do any of the difficult jobs that we all do. I think sometimes I just have to say, um, I got to start the morning, you know, putting on the armor and saying, get me ready for the day. But sometimes I just have to stop and say, 
this is too difficult to do. Help me to get through this. And please be with these people who um, are just mm -hmm. enormously suffering. Yeah. yeah, it's hard to watch. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it, you're right. I think you have to have an anchor. And uh, mm -hmm. it does remind me, I, I at one point worked with a, in a, a cluster of radio stations. One of them is a news station. And they go out and see some of the most uh, horrific things. And I had an opportunity one day to talk to somebody about it and just talk up to them about, you know, this isn't God's plan. This planet right. is messed up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, to share the the true, you know, being mm -hmm. a follower of Christ and what an anchor God can be in your life, um, that can change everything for you. Um, yeah. And it's an opportunity. Uh, unfortunately, absolutely. because we cover so much tragedy, um, you know, pre-COVID, when we were in the office all the time, like normal people, um, <laughs> people came to my office regularly and would say, even if I don't know this God thing or this religion thing, I know that you pray and I know that he listens to you is what they would say. And it's like, he's listened to you. He's waiting for you too. Trust me. Right. Um, mm. He hears your prayers and he wants you to come to him. But if, you know, people would come to me and say, could you pray for me? Or could you pray about this? Or just kind of unload because they knew that it would be a safe place. Um, I count that as a real privilege. I mean, we're now getting back to where we're, we're in and we're seeing each other again. Um, my shingle of, mm. you know, prayer and counseling service has not been put up on my new office yet, yeah. <laughs> but I think people know um, metaphorically that it's there if they want to come see me. Mm. And so um, I count that a privilege. That's beautiful. That's, That's awesome. beautiful. In your heart behind this book, as I as I started out saying, I've already dog-eared it. I've highlighted it, written in pen, and it's mine. And I I just am I'm so grateful for how you've brought these women to the forefront and reminded us as women, we have this place in the world that God intends to use us for His plan. And for his purpose. Wow, why am I getting choked up? Um, I'm just, I'm so grateful for the way you told the stories, even down to a moment ago, you said that the cooking genes skipped a generation. You even have a story <laughs> in there about your mom and making up a relationship with your mother in law, where mm -hmm. there was an opportunity for miscommunication. And I think we have just a minute left. I'd love for you to touch on that as it relates to the story of uh, Naomi and Ruth. Yeah, they're such a beautiful story because they both went through widowhood and were thrown together and Ruth refused to leave Naomi and stayed with her and chose her, chose her family, chose her God, chose her people. And um, I had an amazing, amazing mother-in-law. She, I dedicated this mm -hmm. book to her and she died shortly before um, publication. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I could not have had a more supportive, godly hilarious, wonderful, amazing mother-in-law than I did. And yeah, early on as a, as a young wife, she would call and say things like, Oh, what are you cooking for dinner tonight? And because I can't <laughs> cook and I was always struggling, I took it as like, she's jabbing at me. She knows I can't cook. It wasn't that at all. She was just trying to make conversation with her new daughter-in-law and she had the biggest, biggest heart um, for Christ and for mm. everybody around her. She was just known for unconditional love and the things that we all need, like a great big hug uh, and no judgment. I mean, she just wanted you to know that she loved you and God did too. Mm. And she was just trying to make conversation in the way that yeah. she knew. That's it. I just wanted you to know, well, even, even down to that, just was so ministering. Well, can I ask you, how did you answer that? Did you say Applebee's or would you? Uh, <laughs> um, I was like, listen, you know what I'm great at making? Reservations. <laughs> uh, that's right. My Amen. answer so, is luckily hey, her Mama son Costco. is a good cook. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's awesome. Mama Costco is working hard in my kitchen. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> Tastes delicious. <laughs> oh, Thank Shannon, I know so we much. need to be cognizant yeah. of your time. Is there any last thoughts you'd like to share? No, you know what I love about these books is that I hope that people, even if you're not in church, if you don't know anything about the Bible, if you pick them up, I think you'll be surprised that these are women who are much, much like you. There are study questions you can do on your own or with a book group or a Bible study just to kind of learn more and see how it can apply to your own life. But um, hopefully it's maybe less intimidating to you than picking up the Bible and going through First Kings and trying to find something. Um, these women <laughs> are there. I hope they'll minister to you. I do. That's great. That's awesome. Well, thank, thank you so you much so for your time. Much. Yeah. Thank you guys. Great to see you. Well, God what bless joy you. to get to know you. Thank you. God speed to you and all your ventures. And no barking. That's right. It's a no, I'm so disappointed. <laughs> like, they let me down. They're sleeping. <laughs>
funny. <laughs> Meet you guys. Thank chat you with you. In. So, yeah. We'll make sure we let everybody know that where they can get the book yep. and um, put a link to it. So thank you. God bless you guys. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.